saying to you that the tongues, the interpretation, and those kinds of things are missing from the body of Christ today. Amen. And Paul wrote, and he said, if you want to have a church that's on fire for God, it's not about the facility, it's not about the number, it's about that you have a testimony of Christ. It's about, do, do you sense his presence? Is there a revelation in the auditorium that God is God and no weapon that's formed against us is going to prosper? Is there a tongue? Is there an interpretation in my house? The Lord is saying that. He's looking for that. But in all the things that are going on in our society today, and the church has walked so close to the world that we cannot tell the difference. We are peculiar people. We are a people that is set apart. That doesn't mean we look weird. Doesn't mean we act weird. It means that there's a Holy Ghost anointing that is in us that makes there to be an area around us that causes people to notice that we're not like the world. Amen. Amen. Now that scripture, it's in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, talks about a psalm, a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. That's what God wants in his church. And why? Well, the scripture goes on to say why. It says that the body of Christ might be edified. Yes. Right. Now, I read that and I said, oh, yes, Jesus, I know you want the body to be edified. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, do you understand what edified is? I said, well, I, I think so. Uh -huh. But you know what? When you, when you check it out, the meaning of edify, it means to build a temple, to build a home, to build, to construct something in your life. So we come together to have a psalm and a tongue and interpretation and, and a revelation and a doctrine. We come to share those things so that we can build yes. in one another. So that we don't just sing, stay the same little hut. Is the church hear me? Yeah. The same little lean-to. But we begin to build an edifice in our heart for the body of Christ and for each other. Edify also means heart, the heart, the fireplace. It means to edify, to, 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 to burn, to cause to burn. Remember when they walked on the road to Emmaus with Jesus and he had a conversation they didn't know it was Jesus. Do you remember that? Yeah. And when they got done and they recognized it was Jesus, they said what? Uh -huh. Didn't our hearts burn within us? Yes. Now church, we're not leaving that burning effect on the world. And God wants us to be a, a, an edification to the world. That we need to edify Christ. Not just in church. It's easy to do that here. He wants us to edify him on the job where they curse him. And where they talk ugly. And where they talk nasty. He wants us to edify him in that place. I mean, our school system is nasty. He wants our young people to edify him. There's one to edify out of 500 that don't edify. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And you might be the only Christian on your assembly line. But God wants us to so edify that he lives in us that we make them have a burning sensation when they're around us. To edify means to warm. You have a hard week. You feel annihilated. You feel cold. You feel alone. Have you been through hard things this week? You come into his house and you don't just feel the warmth of the furnace, but you feel the warmth of the love of fellowship. You know, that's what it's all about. So to edify means to instruct. We instruct one another. We warm one another. We burn with passion. Doesn't that take on a great lot of meaning? Yeah. When Paul says, come and, and edify me, do these things in the midst of the house. Well, usually when we go to church, we have a song leader, and we have a preacher, and maybe we have a, 
deacon or elder that says something, but it, the church is for the body. Yes, man. It's for everyone. Yes, yes. If there's something burning in your spirit, it's, it's for everyone. Yes. In the old days, we had a lot of things go on that made the, ner the, the leadership nervous. <laughs> so we just got down to letting one, two, and three do it. But see, God wants his body to share yes. this warmth and this passion. That's why he came to the communion table and he said, look, I have a passion for you fellas and I want to show you that passion before I suffer. Yes. They didn't hear it. He said he was going to suffer. They didn't hear it. And I believe that the church of Jesus Christ is a little deaf today. Yes. They're not hearing what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Because the Spirit of the Lord is saying, I'm coming. I'm coming. Yes. The, the trumpet is at my mouth. I'm coming. Yes. Yes. And the body of Christ is just going on and, and doing the rituals and not the compassion that God is requiring of us. I want to inspire the body of Christ to stir up the gift of God within you. Somebody said, well, I'm, I, I go to church, and I'm faithful, and I pay my tithes, and I, I like my pastor, you know, he or she, they preach a good sermon, we sing great songs. But God is saying to the one who is born again, stir up your spirit. Stir it up. God is stirring me. I, I want to have that kind of relationship with Jesus that he had at the table with his 12. The difference is I want to hear. Yes. I want to yes. hear what he's saying. When he tells me to wait, I want to hear that. When he tells me to go in a different direction, I, I want to hear that. He yes. said, Isaiah wrote, he said, you got ears, but you don't hear. Yes. You got eyes, but you don't see. Church, we need to see the body of Christ. We need to see the needs yes. in the body. We need to hear the voices of those that are hurting, that we can suffer with them and understand where they're at and minister to them. That's what church is all about. You know, salvation is going into the highways and the byways and bringing them to the church and winning them to Christ. What the church is about is that we edify one another and strengthen one another so that we can go out and win them to Christ in the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. I want to inspire you today to say to yourself, you know, what can I activate <coughs> in my life for Christ? What can I activate in my life for Christ? What what gift, what talent, what desire in me has grown cold? What can I stir up? What can I warm myself with that I might edify the church, that body of Christ? Psalm 35, 23 says, Stir up thyself. Awaken to my judgment. Church, there's going to be a judgment day. We don't hear that preached much. Sometimes the TV evangelists get on it, but they don't have to live with the people. <laughs> you know, they can say whatever they want. They can lay it out there, and then they can go away with their offering and forget it. But pastors, if I make you mad, you might not come next Sunday. You might not put your tie in. Does the church hear me? Yes. But nonetheless, we got to speak the truth. Yes. And the word of God says, stir up thyself and awake to judgment. <coughs> Understand that there's judgment when we fail Christ. God judges us. Not one another. We don't judge one another. No. He does the judgment. It says... There it says, awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. God has a cause for the church. And that cause is to bring souls into the kingdom. Psalm 80, 
verse 2. It says, God is speaking there to the tribes of Israel. And this is important, church. He's speaking to Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. These are God's leaders. So I just want you to know that I'm not just speaking to the church. I'm speaking to myself. I'm speaking to leaders across this land. And here in this psalm, God is speaking to leaders and he says, Stir up thy strength. I said, God, what can that mean? He said, may you be strengthened to preach the truth. Strengthened to tell it like it is. Strengthened to warn God's people that there will be a judgment as much as there is a heaven. Again. In scripture, God's talking about stirring ourselves. Paul admonished Timothy. Timothy was just a young man. And he said, I want to put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God. Yes. Talking to the church today, if you're a born-again believer, you have gifts. Yes. Because the gift giver lives in you. Does the church hear me? Yes. May you have a hear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Now you might say, I've never prophesied in my life. Well, you don't have to prophesy unless God tells you to. But, you know, you, God might speak a word to you in season. God spoke a word in season to someone a couple weeks ago. They gave it to me on paper and said, The Spirit of the Lord would move in this house if we were in one accord. It didn't say, Thus saith the Lord, or behold, or anything. There was no spit, nothing. <laughs> but think about that. Yeah. What if every individual desired the move of God and the shaking of his presence and the willingness to lay themselves open like Jesus did at the communion table and say, you know, these are my desires. These are good. These are bad. Help me with the bad. Embrace the good. What would happen? Well, I can tell you. Acts chapter 2. When they were all in one accord, what happened? The Spirit of the Lord fell. And even those that didn't want to speak in tongues, I think maybe they did. That's right. Say so. And some of the, the world came along and said, well, that was for them. That was just for the disciples. No. I read in my book that it's for the generations to come. And I, I can't believe that because it happened to me. And that's what we have to say to them. Stir it up. Now, 2 Peter 3, 1, he says, Beloved, I write unto you. <coughs> what do you think he writes, church? 2 Peter 3, 1. He said, I write to you to stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. Do you remember a time when you felt the power of God? Surely, sometime... In our born-again experience, we have felt the presence of God. We felt it here in these yes. last few yes. minutes. Yes. Yes. And we have to call to remembrance those times that we felt Him. We have to call to remembrance those things. Now, church, let me tell you the truth. If you can't call to remembrance, there needs to be a fresh dedication in your spirit. A, a fresh anointing in your heart because there needs to be a feeling of the presence of God in his house. I don't care. He said we're two or three are gathered together. I'm there. That's right. So it's not about the multitudes. That's right. Church. And it's not about the edifice because he wants to live in you. Stir up your pure mind. First of all, we have to have a pure mind. That's hard today. Yes. Television's filthy. Yeah. Amen. Everywhere you go, signs, yes. advertisements, not good. They speak to the flesh. Can you hear me? Yes. You know, everything that surrounds us wants to pull us away from the pure mind. Well, 
a pure mind is just one that's focused on the Lord. And when the filth goes through, we deny it. And we ask God to forgive us, and we move on. But the point is, we have to recognize it. But see, we're so prone to just sleep through it. Well, I don't listen to that. I just listen to this. But you heard it. Funny thing, we can hear that, but we can't hear the voice of the Lord. Church, God is speaking to his body. He's speaking to his church at large. To have an ear to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Do you remember his acts? His acts in your life? What has he done for you that helped you? Did he bring you through something? Did he change something for you? Did he encourage you somewhere? This is that's what we want to do. We want to remember. I remember somebody said, leave everything behind you, don't look back. Well, let me tell the church this. If you don't remember where you come from, you never know where he brought you to. That's right. You don't look back to mourn and, and whine about it and talk about it and tell others about it. You look back and you say, oh, Jesus, you delivered me. You brought me through. I feel your Holy Spirit. I don't even remember those things. Devil, get out of here. That's right. <laughs> You know what I'm saying to you? Yes, yes. Every once in a while, you have to have that kind of come through that you can remember what God has done supernaturally for you in your life. It's important. And Psalm 105, 1 and 8, it's an admonition to praise. 42 times in this Psalm 105, 42 times it it, it, it praises the acts of God, the things that God has done. If all you ever did is rise up in the morning and read Psalm 105, you would be giving glory to God. Yeah. And if before you went to bed, if you opened it up and read Psalm 105, you would be giving glory to God. Yeah. Now I want to say this in love, church, but God is tired of the little dinky thank yous. God wants us to elaborate on our thankfulness to him. And uh, it's so wonderful. It, there's 45 verses here and 42 acts of God. I want to encourage you in your devotions to read this. But let's just read the first few verses just to get a feel of it this morning. It's Psalm 105. We'll just read 1 through 4 or 5 there. Let's just read it together if you've got it. I love to hear the word of God read. It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing songs unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory be in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works that he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O oh, ye seed of Abraham, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. This includes us, church. Yes. Thousands of generations. Now that wasn't too hard, was it? You just no. give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Oh, church, let us rise up and praise and adore the Lord and seek his face and seek his anointing and seek his passion. The kind of passion that stood at the table the kind of intimacy that he wanted to share with those 12. And he didn't just want to share it with them. He wanted to share it with us because then he took the cup and he took the bread and he said, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Guess what, church? How often do you eat bread? How often do you drink juice? As often as you drink juice, and as often as you eat bread, you're supposed to think about him. You know, he was God. He could have given explosive, wonderful emblems 
to remember it. But what did he do? He sat at the supper table. He picked out the emblems that they would see every day, that they would partake of every day. And he used them to glorify himself for them. He wanted us to think of him often. In church, we come on Sunday, we worship him, we thank of him. How, how often do we think of him during the week and glorify him and worship him? It's in my heart today to admonish you and to challenge you to not just give praise and adoration, but to seek his face until you feel his passion and until you desire him more than the things of this world. David got captivated by the Philistines. This is a neat story. How many know that the devil tries to captivate us? Um. And the Philistines was David's worst enemy. And they captivated him. And he writes about it in Psalm 56. And he says, <clears throat> My enemies would daily swallow me up. For they were many that fought against me. Does anybody feel anything fighting against you? Oh. He says, oh thou most high. He's in the midst of being captivated by the enemy. And he's going to worship. So in the midst of his captivation and the, and the fear of being caught by the enemy, he says, oh thou most high, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Oh, sing unto the Lord, all ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. His holiness is more powerful than the works of darkness. Yes. Church. Yes. Psalm 106 says, praise you the Lord. I mean, have you ever read the Psalms? It says, for his mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. How many have been the recipient of his mercy? Amen. His mercy endures forever. He asks two questions in this Psalm 106. And he says, who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? And who can show forth his praise? Who can do that, church? Psalm 107 answers that, Danny. You're right. Psalm 107 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord, what? Say so. He has redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. Yes. You know what, church? We'd be destroyed if we didn't have God on our yes, side. Yes, that's right. I've met Christians who have lost their hope in God, moved away from God, and there is no hope in them. They are destitute and desperate without God. You know, you've gone through a trial and tribulation and your heart hurt from the devastation of it, but you knew that you could turn to God and he would understand because he has suffered and bled and died for us. He has been physically abused. He has been mentally abused. He hung on the cross. They walked in front of him, who he died for. They spit upon him. They mocked him. They said, let his blood be upon us. Nobody ever talks about the psychological abuse that Jesus suffered. Because if they would preach that and teach that, we wouldn't have saints that need psychology help. Because Jesus' blood will cover. It will cover it covers everything. He's the healer of anything that harasses you. So as we come to the Lord's table today and as we receive the emblems of his body and his blood, may there be an awesome awareness of his desire. How many know what desire is? When you want coffee and you don't have it, when you love chocolate and there's none available, you know that's pitiful, but we understand desire when I say that. But we need Jesus like that every day because without him, we have a desire for him. 
And that desire is missing in Christianity. And it's missing in this church. But I tell you, when his people come together with one desire, like they did on the day of, day of Pentecost, and every heart desires him, oh, saints, there'll be a fresh outpouring yes. of his yes. presence. Yes. I believe that God is calling us as a church to wait on him. To wait on him. To take a moment in every day and set aside that moment and wait on him. If it's five minutes, set it on your watch or your clock or your calendar. Because once you set that moment, you say, this, this moment of the day, I'm going to give 10 minutes. If you work, you can do that 10 minutes on your job, on your lunch. You'll find out that everything in this world will harass you yes. in that 10 minutes. Because the enemy knows if you give that moment of passion to God, God will envelop your life in supernatural. Amen. Think what he will do to the body of Christ if we set aside a moment. Just a moment. Mm -hmm. You see, Acts 2 4 says they were all what? Filled. Filled. Now here's what's happened, church. The church has been filled, but are we full? Yes. See, we've been filled, but are we full? We're supposed to be so filled that we're dripping out. And those drips are showing the world that we're peculiar, that we're different. We don't use their language. We don't act like them in a crisis. We don't get on board and fuss at the, the constituency of our company because they didn't give us a raise. We say, blessed be the name of the Lord. God wants to fill his body afresh. So when we read that scripture, it says, when you come together, let everyone have a song. That means there's a song, song, S-E-S-A-L-M. There's a song in your spirit. <coughs> to get that, you have to read it. Yes. And the doctrine. The doctrine, like um, Brian sings that song, filled with the Holy Ghost. That's a doctrine, be filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God, I was filled with the Holy Ghost this week at work. Amen. I just testified and God just moved and... and <clears throat> a tongue. I don't know if everyone here speaks in tongues, but if you don't, come see Philip. <laughs> She's not here today, but she'll be here. No, just come. Anybody can pray with you. It's not what a person does, it's that it's him. Yes. And you need that. You need that heavenly language because the devil don't know what you're talking about. Yes. When you get down and pray and say, Lord, I'm sick, the devil says, yeah, put it on her. But when you speak in tongues, he, he's standing there scratching his head. He doesn't know God's language. We need it. It empowers us. <coughs> then he says, have a revelation. Somebody said, well, uh, that's like the book of Revelation. No, I, I had a revelation this week. And God said, you know, if you just wait, I'd move. And I said, well, Lord, you know how hard that is. <laughs> I get impatient. And he said, but I'm not impatient. See, that's revelatory to me. Yes. That's revelatory to me. Because what I learned is, I want so much for God to move in the church, but I don't wait on him. So that's revelatory. And God will speak to you like that, and he'll tell you something to do in your life, and you'll say, well, I've been doing that, and he'll say, wait a minute. Let's look at this a little closer. And then all of a sudden, you'll have a revelation. That's what a revelation is. Of course, it can be something revelatory like the book of Revelation. But you can read John 3.16 and he can give you a revelation that you never saw. Yes. Because the word is limitless. Amen. 
and an interpretation. We have a tongue. We need an interpretation. Sometimes in your prayer life, if you stay long enough and you start to invoke the heavenly language and you pray in, in tongues for a little while and then you're just kind of, you know, kind of ebbs down and you, you just kind of sit there and wait. He may speak something special to your heart. He might interpret what you just said. We aren't taught that truth. God wants to reveal himself in a supernatural way in this last hour, and it will happen at his table. If those disciples would have heard what he said at the table, they would have been revolutionized. They would be. So what I want to say to the church this morning as we come to the table, as I, I have especially to, in just a moment, to just prepare the table, and I just want us to come to the table and, and envision that the Lord is at the table. And then think in your heart, God, what can I activate for you because you gave me your body and you gave me your blood and you, you, you healed me and you saved me and you set me free. What can I do for you? You suffered for me. So first, when you come to the table, let's not rush by. Let's just stand one at a time. I mean, so let's come together, but, you know, one at a time. Stand for one moment. Be challenged. Ask God, give thanks, and ask him, what can I do to activate your presence in my life? Let's just bow our heads. Let us meditate upon it for a moment. Paul said, examine yourself. Somebody said, well, I examined myself and I don't feel worthy. Paul said, examine, get right, and partake. Activate something in our life today as we give thanks. 